The specific element to the US context is the polarization here is stunning. So when you have the divisions that you have in this country, it means that when you're trying to sow disinformation, you already have you know, two groups who no longer have debates and say, that's interesting, let me hear what you think. It's you say something that I don't agree with and I say I hate you. I mean, where does that take us when we don't actually have that middle ground to debate? It goes without saying that a self-governing people need reliable sources of information about the choices before them. The news media, upon which we rely for this information, cannot perform its proper function without the trust of the news consumer, nor can it provide an essential check on our public officials without that trust. This is why the so-called fake news phenomenon is so pernicious. Helped along by our president's Twitter feed, fake news has become a meme that means different things to different people. One of our goals this afternoon is to understand some of these, what some of these different meanings are and how they are used to influence us. Print media, internet publication, documentary film, straight news and satire, all are represented on our panel today which I will now turn over to our moderator, Sasha Pfeiffer. So, so Marty Scher works for The Onion, which many of you may know is a satirical website. So we thought Marty was a really great addition because one of the fascinating things about The Onion is part of what they do is make things up, but they're also very, very precise about wanting to make sure that all their facts are correct because in order for satire to work, you can't be basically making up what's, what's not correct. So it's a really fascinating balance that I think Marty's gonna talk about later. Uh, Charles is a, is a very accomplished documentarian, and I think part of what will be really interesting to hear from him tonight is that obviously when people make documentaries, there is a bit of license, and, but now we have what some people consider mockumentaries, particularly that we've seen made to discredit political candidates, so I think we hope to talk about that. And Claire has a really interesting background in a variety of media and is working with an organization now called First Draft News, which is really addressing a lot of the issues that we're talking about today. So again, more detailed bios in your program. But one of the things I wanna talk very broadly about is that when we decided on this topic of fake news months ago, it was fresher than it is now. And because I'm a working reporter, I feel sort of fatigued by this topic because fake news has become so meaningless in a way in its definition. I mean, it ranges from teenagers in Moldova making up fake websites to drive traffic and clicks to make money, to our president who, as we know, many people think labels fake news anything he finds unpleasant or doesn't like, to in some cases when reporters simply make errors, that gets labeled fake news. That's not what I consider fake news, that's a mistake and that should be corrected. But I wanna read something that Claire wrote that I thought was really, really helpful. She wrote, by now we have all agreed that the term fake news is unhelpful, but without an alternative, we're left awkwardly using air quotes whenever we utter the phrase. The reason we're struggling with a replacement is because this is about more than news. It's about the entire information ecosystem. The term fake doesn't begin to describe the complexity of the different types of misinformation and disinformation. So Claire has let a, spent a lot of time thinking about that. What is misinformation? What's disinformation? What's malinformation? What's propaganda? So Claire, would you start us off in terms of how you've tried to think more precisely about what that is? Absolutely, and thank you for allowing me to start by saying we can't use this term. <laughs> So A, it's unhelpful, and I'll explain why. But secondly, it's being used as a weapon against the free press. So it, for me, it's non-negotiable. This We cannot play into this. Words matter. And so when I have journalists call me up and say, can I talk to you about fake news? Like, it is being used as a weapon against you. Please don't use the same phrase. It's in our interest to be much more specific about it. So misinformation is false information that gets shared, but nobody means any harm by it. So it might be my mum sharing something on Facebook that she just hasn't checked. She's not trying to do anything mean. She just hasn't taken the time to do her checks. That's different to disinformation, which is also false, but the person who's sharing it knows it's false and is trying to do harm. So all the recent news about Russian disinformation, this is a technique that the Russians use, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but that is an attempt to do harm. I then talk about malinformation, which is true information that's used to do harm. So leaked emails, for example, 
Those emails were true, but that information was being used to cause harm. So I like to talk about pollution, information pollution. There's different types of pollution. There's different elements of the scale. But th this term, <laughs> fake news, is not a term that we can use. So I would be grateful if we could not use it during this panel, <laughs> because we're not helping anybody by continuing to use the term. So is the better term just sort of bad information for the purpose of this? What do you think is the term that should be used if we had to pick one? Or do you think that's impossible? We actually need to sort of define very precisely before we even pick a definition. I mean, I talk about information disorder or information pollution. It's a much bigger scale than just news. As I said, this is, this is about people making mistakes. It's, there's a whole spectrum. So we have to be much more careful about the language we use. So Marnie, would you weigh in? Because sometimes when people read The Onion and don't realize what it is, they think it's correct, which is, you know, and then suddenly they don't realize they're reading something meant to be funny. Can you talk about how you distinguish for people what you do and what fake news is? Absolutely. Sasha. <laughs> Strike one. You need to have a tip jar. If there was a tip jar and you had to put a dollar in every time, we'd be fine. Well, and I'm wondering where um, along that spectrum of malinformation, disinformation, misinformation we sit because The Onion uh, publishes knowingly incorrect information in service of what we believe is a higher truth. Um, so we, we knowingly publish things that are not real and that are constructed scenarios, but they're very much anchored to a real political landscape and the, you know, what we believe it to be a true assessment of what that landscape entails. And so a big part of that is thinking of your audience and um, our, our party line, I guess you would say, we want to train our audience, we do not want to trick them. And so intent has a, a, a lot to do with this, um, this, this definition of the misinformation or disinformation, and it also has everything to do with how it's received by the public and how much you can stand behind it as the purveyor of that uh, non-truth. Charles, can you weigh in when you think about fake news, particularly in the context of the medium that you work in? Oh, disinformation. Can you talk about how you define it, how you think of it? Uh, this is enormously complicated. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a local immediate sense in, that's pertinent to the work that I do. Uh, when you make and distribute documentary films, as I do, um, uh, documentary filmmakers have a quite substantial burden of responsibility precisely because they have uh, in many ways so much freedom uh, when you know Sony Classics distributes a film that I make they might have a lawyer look at it but they really don't have much of an idea of whether everything in it is accurate or not and uh, so I've, I've tried very hard to make sure that what I do is factually accurate, um, and, and rigorously so, uh, helped by, I think, my, my academic training. I have a PhD in political science, and my thesis advisor was a really tough guy. <laughs> um, it, uh, it is, it is interesting to see, you know, one, one thing in this debate is, it, that frequently comes up is particularly in uh, various internet channels, media locations, it's very easy to synthesize things that aren't true. Uh, and as you know, as a filmmaker, I, I see those tools and I use those tools all the time now. And it is, in fact, astoundingly easy to falsify things. And um, indeed, there's a there's a term among documentary editors, Frankenbiting. So, uh, Frankenbiting. Frankenbiting. Franken F R A N K E N B I T I N G. Franking. Correct. Franking. Like. As in Frankenstein plus soundbite. <laughs> so, uh, if you see an interview on television or in a documentary film uh, or on the internet, if you see an interview where, for a moment or more than a moment, the camera cuts away from the face of the person speaking, that's probably because there's a cut which is being concealed from you and which you cannot hear and you cannot see 
and which involves deletion and or addition of substantial amounts of text. And it's extremely easy to do it, and in fact, you have to do it, because people, when they speak in interviews, are inarticulate, and if you want to make their delivery efficient and smooth, and you want your film to flow appropriately, you have to do, on a small level, this very kind of local faking. Obviously, that's a dangerous thing, and it's a dangerous power to have, and one that has to be used very carefully. Uh, and it is, it is, so there is, I think, a, a, a uniquely technological element to what we're going through now. We're going through, we're going through a period in which uh, many aspects of technological progress, well, progress is, of course, a loaded term, technological change, are outstripping it, our ability to regulate them, uh, and in many cases, our ability to un even understand them or know what's going on um, underneath what you might be watching or reading. And, and I do think that that is one striking element of the problems that we face. Another one, also technologically related, is that in a very short period of time, over the last five or 10 years, a small number of firms, and most particularly now Facebook, but Facebook, Google, a few others, um, have become extraordinarily powerful and universal, and they are astoundingly opaque. And uh, yeah, that's I think let's let's come back to that because I think that's going to be a big topic tonight because I think we're finally seeing Google, Facebook, and to some extent Twitter realize they have some responsibility since their software, their platforms is what is largely so responsible for the spread of this. What Charles was saying about the manipulation, uh, the uh, the ability to manipulate broadcast, made me think back to when I transitioned from the newspaper world to the radio world, because when you write for when you write for a newspaper and if you are going to edit out what someone said we have an obligation to put in an ellipsis dot 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 that indicates to the reader we remove some words you can't tell when someone does that in newspaper or radio and i remember when i would do radio interviews people would sometimes say please don't make me sound bad and i would always think to myself you don't know how good you're going to sound once we finish editing out the ums and the ahs and the things that would slow down or bog down if you were to actually listen to the raw interview. But that's benevolent editing. You know, that's simply to sort of clarify and speed up. But there's technology now that is far from benevolent. I mean, from Photoshop used for ill purposes to audio that not only can remove chunks of what people said, but there was recently a radio story about audio that can basically take someone's words and voice and make them say things they never said just by sort of jigsawing together previous, so it's very, it's very, um, it's very troubling. Back to something Claire said. Can I just jump in very quickly? Because you might have seen that, which is a video of Obama, where people basically made Obama say things that he hadn't said. And I saw that and I thought, oh, we're in so much trouble. Well, yeah. What we have to remember is that we're now in this kind of arms race. Because just after that, some researchers from Carnegie Mellon came out and said, we can tell that that wasn't real because we actually look at blood vessels in a face and we can tell that the blood isn't moving quickly enough. So that's what's kind of astonishing, is that we get terrified, and then researchers do something amazing, and then we'll get more terrified. Yeah. But it's the speed of, the, of these changes is quite something. And to go back to something Claire said earlier, the end result is the weaponization of information. I mean, it's almost like words can be used as little bombs or missiles, take the internet, and they get spread very widely. And as you said, the consumer ends up somewhat responsible, because if we share something online, you're essentially spreading lies, potentially. And you know, that, that effort to weaponize is, an, is intentionally to distract and to dismiss us and to dismay people, and it's very effective. Can you talk a little bit about that weaponization piece? So of course, now that we've recognized the role that Russia played in the US election in 2016, and there will be much more information that drips out, the speed at which we're now learning about this is somewhat shocking. Well, when we think about what Russia is attempting to do, and other states, there are many other countries around the world that are involved in this, but the aim is not necessarily to push out specific lies. 
it's to make us distrust the media, which is why we can't use this term, because the way that the president is using it is to make us believe that we can't trust anybody other than him. But the role that Russia is trying to play is not about individual stories, it's about us just giving up and saying, I don't trust anything I see anymore. I don't know who to trust, everything is, is problematic. So the fact that they were trying to sow distrust around cultural issues, whether that was race, gun rights, uh, queer rights, that's what we need to recognize, that this isn't necessarily the spreading of information about political candidates, it's about using divisions that already exist in the US to increase tensions that already lie within this country and others. So we need to be really aware of those techniques which are incredibly sophisticated. So this idea that, well, if only we just have more fact checkers, we'll be fine. This isn't, we're, we're past that. This is actually using information warfare and techniques that have been honed by the military to work out how do you undermine your enemy. Marnie, do you have a view on this? Because in some ways I feel like you straddle these two worlds. You know, it's sort of, the work you do is ultimately benevolent, it's meant to educate. But the goal of, of sort of the misinformation is to polarize us. And as, as someone said, to kind of get us to eat our own institutions, to distrust our government, to distrust our media. So how do you think about all this? There are definitely times when we are taken as real news. And people assume that that's delightful for us or that it's very funny to see people scrambling to, to fact check our work. That is a real disappointment because it means we have not done our jobs as well as we possibly could have or that people are not seeing our publication for all that it can be for them. Um, when people take our stories as fact, what they're missing is it takes a lot of work to craft that story and if our real intention was just to mislead, we'd have a lot easier of a job because like it was said earlier, it is very, very easy to spread misinformation and to do so maliciously which I guess is disinformation, right? Um, so our view is uh, we have to broadcast our intent without outright saying it because we don't want to disrupt our conceit as a news publication. In order to provide the most effective critique of the media landscape, we have to mimic it perfectly and still in an unsaid way, make sure people know what we're doing. And if that communication breaks down between us and the readers, then um, we, we become another source of misinformation. And that is you know, something we always want to avoid. I want to go back to that role of the technology companies because this is absolutely enormous. I mean, most people's experience of the internet is Facebook or Google. You know, Google is where you sort of start, where you begin your searches. And you know, we saw after the election, when Mark Zuckerberg was very defensive, you know, he said this is this crazy outlandish idea that our platform could somehow have been used to spread, mis to spread misinformation. Very quickly, he did a 180 on that and is now trying to make real efforts to see what Facebook can do to not allow it to be manipulated to spread information. Charles, your sense of how responsible are technology companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter for not, I don't know if the word is controlling their creations well enough to let them be used for evil purposes. I, I think, unfortunately, um, they get a very bad score. And, uh, and part of that is ignorance. Uh, they were, to some extent, in some ways, caught by surprise by what has been happening. Uh, but to some extent, it's not ignorance. Um, if, you, if you look at Facebook, not just, in fact, not in the United States, but you know, think about Facebook in Pakistan, think about Facebook in Iran, in Iraq, in Turkey, in Russia, in Belarus, uh, all countries in which Facebook operates and countries in which Facebook makes a lot of money, Saudi Arabia, um, Afghanistan. Uh, it's, it, my guess is that the people who run Facebook are quite aware that there's a great deal of unpleasant and untruthful activity and from which they make quite a lot of money. And I don't think they're very interested in having that investigated. You think that the profit ends up trumping whatever troubling, whatever trouble there is to their conscience in watching this happens? Yes, unless uh, the discomfort from social, political, public pressure uh, tips that balance. But at the moment, I think that, it, or up to now, they have rationally and correctly calculated that secrecy and opacity are in their interest. 
you know, um, one of the, as, as Facebook sort of continues to confess in a way to what it's learned about how its technology can be used for, for poor purposes, we now know that Facebook has disclosed that something like what, three, at least 3,000 ads on Facebook were bought by Russians attempted to influence the election. But it's much more precise than that. It's that those ads were actually, actually aimed at swing states. And I mean, it's really, really nefarious. Claire, how much work have you done on this in terms of specific examples of how we, you know, we, for those of us who are on Twitter, for example, you can look at what seems to be a lot of chatter about some political or social issue, and you have no idea that that's entirely manufactured, and it's made to look as if there's a greater public concern about that or a public opinion about that than there really is. So I think the first thing I'd say is that we have to recognize that Facebook is a marketing platform. So we, as users, think it's a way to connect with friends and family. It is a marketing platform. So previously, if I wanted to advertise, I might take an advertisement out on the side of a bus, and I would drive it through Boston, and I would hope some people that I was trying to reach would see my advert. What Facebook allows me to do is to say, I specifically want to reach people aged between 45 and 55 who live in Somerville and ride a bike and play tennis and have got three children and are African American. I mean, you can be that specific. So as a marketing tool, it's incredible. I used to work for the UN Refugee Agency, and we used to use that same technology to target people that we believed the money would be more effectively spent because we were trying to reach people who we thought were more likely to care about refugees. What the Russians did was take that exact same technology and use it for their purposes. So when we talk about being nefarious, the problem is, is that Silicon Valley created this technology, and because in Silicon Valley they really believe the best in the world, I mean, they are great people, but they really believe that technology is the answer to all ills. If you talk to journalists, they'll immediately say, well, what will happen is there'll be dark forces, but actually in Silicon Valley they really believe the best. So they, they just thought about the UN Refugee Agency and how it would help our targeting of our ads. They didn't think about how could foreign governments try and influence our election. And that's why they've been caught out, because they weren't looking. And I think the other thing I'd say, Charles, is I agree with you in that they need to take much greater responsibility. But the scale of Facebook, I mean, it was started by Mark Zuckerberg across the river as a way for people to connect. In less than 15 years, two billion people around the world speaking multiple languages in different cultures with different legal contexts use his platform. And they have not hired enough people to moderate. And they're thinking that algorithms can do all the work and they can use computational methods to scale. What this has shown is they need a mixture of algorithms and people. People cost money and they need their shareholders to say, Mark, you've got to spend this money, otherwise Facebook will become meaningless because it will become a cesspool. Right, in fact, one of the announcements uh, Facebook if, recently if I made. Might, excuse me, make one brief comment. I, I, I must disagree, or at least possibly disagree in one regard. Uh, the people who run Facebook and Google are not naive, innocent people. These are very smart people, and they know what's going on. They do know what is going on, but I think this idea of when they, when they think about what their technology can do, it has grown so fast, and the scale has happened. The idea that they're sitting around you know, stroking their fingers about it. I agree, it, they're commercial companies and they don't have an interest to do it and they will always think about the bottom line. But when you talk to people in Facebook, you know, this idea of when they, for example, Facebook Live. Facebook Live for them was a technology that allowed people to film their children's birthday, birthday parties. All they could see was the good things. Journalists said, this will be used for executions of terrorists and suicides. And, and look what's happened. So I think there is, an, there is a disconnect there between the realities of, of the world and how the internet will always reflect both the good and bad in human nature. One of the announcements Facebook recently made is that it will hire a thousand people to now review ads and try to determine their credibility. It sounds like a nice effort, except Facebook has, I think, two billion monthly users. So a thousand people trying to monitor that gives you a sense of how outmatched they are. And as Claire said, there really requires just a retooling of the algorithms they use that decide what's get it, what gets attention, what shows up in your feed. Uh, Marnie, has The Onion sort of taken on the big tech companies at all in terms of how you satirize and how you try to call them out on what they've done? We love writing articles about Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> um, <laughs> Most recently, I think we did, uh, Mark Zuckerberg admits he has no idea why anyone still uses Facebook. <laughs> and uh, that was definitely a story about um, how it has just fallen into these cesspools of marketing, advertising, targeted uh, you know, products and um, sidebars and auto-playing videos. And so in, in Mark Zuckerberg's mouth, we put quotes like, I just don't know why anybody's still on there. I don't even want to be on Facebook. I think about deactivating my account every day. 
Um, and we, we feel personally invested in calling out things like Facebook and Google because we ourselves are influenced by it or, or have to, um, you know, we, we do publish our content to Facebook. We have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, we have an Instagram account. And um, I think that it becomes really important to know what our material, um, how it interacts with that ecosystem. And um, one thing we found is that Facebook's algorithms have attempted to make sense of us for readers, and that has had its own failings. We, for a while, had a tag next to our articles that said, satire. And it just <laughs> seemed like it took agency away from readers because we, we demand a high level of engagement with readers and we demand their understanding of our mission. And when Facebook just sort of tries to remove all that uh, mental labor by placing satire next to it, it really kind of um, you know, deadens the joke a bit and it takes away the excitement and the enjoyment for readers. And so it's been interesting trying to negotiate that landscape as their algorithms interplay with our content. One of the things we often hear in this context and this is a very big picture thing is that what happening erodes and threatens democracy. I'm wondering if the three of you believe that. Is that too dire of a pronouncement? Or do you actually think, does it have that effect? And if so, what is it about what's happening can erode a democracy? So, so I've recently started writing about strategic silence because I have concerns about the level of reporting now about disinformation, hacking, bots, um, because People know that it will get traffic. If you dig deep enough for bots, you will find evidence of bot activity. So we did a project recently around the German election. Yeah, there were bots there. There wasn't that many bots, and I wouldn't argue that they had an impact. I think what had more impact was all the news articles about bots in the German election. And my concern is, as a news industry, we're not having conversations about when we should be reporting and how we should be reporting these particular aspects. And my concern is that we're actually doing the job of Russia for them by turning people off the institutions and the democratic process by saying, what's the point in voting? I mean, the, the story about 21 states were hacked. Well, as journalists, what do we mean when we say hacked? Is it that we, the emails were hacked? Does it mean that the voting logs were hacked? Does it mean the machines were hacked? We're actually doing a really bad job of explaining what's happening. There's a lot of noise about this. And whilst it feels uncomfortable to talk about not reporting on it, my concern is in 10 years time, social scientists will say, we managed to depress the turnout because of our reporting on this topic in a way that was irresponsible. I think that's very true. You know, there are some people that think, are you trying to tell me that my voting machines were, ha were manipulated by Russians? But they're not realizing it can simply mean that so much of what you saw in your Facebook feed was made up, you know? And so again, I think people, the distinctions are very difficult. Uh, Charles, a, a view on this, sort of the, the impact on democracy? Uh, well, I think, I think we are living in a, uh, perhaps we've just entered ha or are entering a, a rather perilous moment in which these technological dislocations uh, are coinciding with a great deal of economic, social, cultural dislocation as well. And, um, and a lot of distrust of government, which can easily turn into distrust of democracy and distrust of elections, distrust of media, distrust of news, distrust of information. And, um, and, and a great deal of that distrust is merited. And unfortunately, when you're in a circumstance like that, um, you know, you can, in the 1930s, you could have either gotten Franklin Roosevelt or Hitler, you know, those situations can go um, very differently. And so I, I think we are in a difficult moment now. Uh, I, I've started working on, uh, there, there are two projects that I'm working on that are relevant. One is uh, current film that I'm making is is about the Watergate scandal, in which fake news, as it existed at that time, played a quite significant role. And and at the same time, I'm also working now on uh, a future film about these issues, these current issues. And there are there are many parallels, but, but this, this specifically technological aspect of our current condition is, I think, very fundamental and potentially quite disturbing. And Marnie, in, in your view, in The Onion's view, is democracy actually in peril, or does that just feel to you like something that's ripe for being satirized? 
think we're always going to find something that's uh, rife for satire. Uh, and, and so that kind of builds in a bit of, um, you need hope in order to make that interesting. I think that we, we want to try to, if not steer things in the right direction, just call out the things that are going in the wrong direction. And I can't make a big statement about where we're headed, but I do know that um, we have a lot of readers and um, we have an audience that encourages me every day. Claire made this reference to strategic silence, and I'm really interested in this because this gets to how is the media supposed to cover this or are we not supposed to cover it at all? And if we choose not to cover it, we're making a judgment call of sorts, and maybe that's the wrong judgment call. But I think part of the point here is that for people trying to spread misinformation, it doesn't matter if the way it gets covered is to debunk it or to try to dismiss it. They're just glad that it got covered. So even if you're just saying that's not true, that's not true, now you're spreading it. So how do we decide what we just ignore? So I think the first thing is making journalists aware of how they themselves are being manipulated by those people trying to spread disinformation. So for example, at the moment, there is a campaign to discredit the census. And so Things are happening, such as having Wikipedia pages edited. There are people creating websites that are full of fabricated information. And then people are asking journalists questions on Twitter, making the journalists go, well, that's an interesting story. Let me go and do some research. Goes to the Wikipedia page that's fabricated, goes to the websites that are fabricated, and becomes part of that web. So one thing I try to talk to journalists about is how can they be aware of these tactics? Because as you say, Often, the people who are spreading this information, they see debunks as a form of engagement. They see this as, well, there's oxygen that has been given to that rumor. Great, I don't care. Nobody cares if it's got a stamp on it that says debunked. So I think we just need to think very differently about the way that we report and think as an industry about how we're being used because we are amplifying this. So we have a, very, we have a responsibility with our megaphones to think very carefully about what we report and how. And this was obviously an enormous issue in the 2016 presidential election as well. When after, after the results of that election, so much fury was heaped on the media. You know, did we cover it wrong? Did we, did we make Trump into what he was by giving him all the attention he was, that he got? And um, Marnie, I found this interview. There's an NPR reporter named Sam Sanders who had come to The Onion and done an interview. And I love this part. Uh, the, the, the managing editor at The Onion is Cole Bolton. Is he still? He's the editor in chief, okay. Oh, that's right. And so Cole said, this is in the interview with Sam, he said, I think we went a little mad during the election, or I think we're going a little mad during this presidency. He was talking about how it's covered. And Sam Sanders of NPR replied, every time the New York Times or the Washington Post has anything new, everyone's like, whoa, my God, it's like a dog with a squirrel. And there's a new squirrel every five minutes, but you never catch that squirrel. You're just like squirrel, 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 squirrel. And I feel like you guys are chasing fewer squirrels. And you made this interesting comment that being um, located outside of Washington, you feel like gives you a sense to step back and not be just in the chaos of it where you can't get out of it and you can put it in a bit more, a bit more context. Do you feel like watching the rest of the media, there is this frenzy that sometimes is overstating the case or giving too much attention to things in a way that, that ends up um, meaning that maybe not covering it might have been the wiser journalistic move? I don't envy uh, journalistic outlets for having to make those calls at all because we have the luxury to report on what we want to report on and then not cover things we don't think we can make the strongest comment on. So our call is always, can we make this comment in a way that feels universally true, um, defensible, um, and we don't have to make the call, uh, you know, do, what do our readers, uh, you know, deserve to hear about, what, what does the media landscape at large need to know about. We can stand behind precisely what we want to and make surgical calls about different news stories versus others. And so um, during the election, for example, we, uh, it was a challenge to figure out how to cover all the different candidates and at the beginning of the election cycle there were so many candidates and um, you can only cover so many and then as it funneled downward into the general election um, one tactic that we took was to provide a lot more coverage about the voters and the nation and the the symptoms that led to the as some people consider it fallout of the 2016 election and uh, our, our tactic has always been to follow what feels true versus you know, what, what stories happen to be in the zeitgeist at any given moment. And Charles, as you watch media coverage of misinformation, bad information, 
politics. Do you feel like the media, how often are we doing it right and how often are we doing it wrong? I think the media is getting better about it. Uh, the, the activities of the Russians, for example, have been known, I, I, I have a, a background in technology, or I used to, and I still know a lot of people in you know, that universe. Uh, and if if you were in uh, the information security area, um, what's now called cybersecurity, you knew that the Russians were doing this kind of thing uh, for at least a decade, and in a in a quite nasty, large scale way. So I think that people are waking up about this now, and I think that's a good thing, but, it, but this, it, it's actually a, a vast universe. The Russians are not the only ones who do it. And, uh, and fake advertisements on Facebook are not the only tool that are, that's employed in this universe. There's a, a lot of tools that are employed for a lot of purposes. Um, information intrusion, uh, surveillance of various forms, leaks of various forms, um, and uh, I, think, I think it's an area um, where there's going to be a, a great deal of pressure and contention for about another decade before we finally figure out how to regulate it. I want to look at this from a sort of very different perspective, which is whether it's possible that we're wringing our hands about something that is just part of a historic cycle. I, I had found this um, in a letter in 1807 that Thomas Jefferson wrote, and he wrote, nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. The man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, the journalists of the United States have a scanty education and a vulgar turn of mind. And in 1925, there was an article in Harper's Magazine. The headline was Fake News in the Public. And you know, in the 1830s, there was what was known as the penny press. You know, it was a sort of commercially minded, sensationally oriented press. So is what we're seeing today any different, or is this just part of cycle and we've lost perspective? So we have to work out that as humans, we've always loved to gossip. You know, apparently it's because we can't take ticks off each other that we gossip. It's a way that we can connect with one another. <laughs> so we have always traded in information that wasn't true. And yes, I mean, it's important that we understand the historical context of all of this. What's happened is that that um, disposition has now been supercharged because not only is this easier to create this content than ever before. Anybody who's got a child or a grandchild who's eight and watching them and what they can do and create on their iMovie is unbelievable. We've got Photoshop, so we've got very cheap content, very easy to manipulate, and then it spreads at speed through these networks that are designed to be addictive and for information to, to be shared very, very quickly. But the other thing is that this false information is being passed between peers. It's being passed between people that trust one another. So we're actually much less likely to be critical. Whereas even if it was false in a newspaper, you had this idea of I'm reading a newspaper. Now, well, it's come from my mom or it's come from my best friend. Why would I even challenge that? So the public is part of the misinformation network. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we have been weaponized. <laughs> you know, another issue that comes up a lot is that you know, trust in the media is obviously at a very low level. So this comes at a time when public trust in the media is at a low level. Civic political participation is very low. The internet allows things to fly like wildfire and spread. So do you feel, Marnie, like we're also in a different moment than just another cycle of history? Well, I'm a part of a publication that's been around since 1988. Um, and so we really have those three decades to look at in terms of our product versus the readers and how they interact with it. Um, and I think there's always been a misunderstanding of what we do, and there's always been a love of what we do. And so we're just going to continue to follow uh, a very vetted formula for how we approach covering the news and uh, hope that it sticks. <laughs> and Charles, in your view, just part of history? Or is there something unique about what's happening today? I, I do think there is something unique about the technological situation. Uh, the, the, 
the, the technology crowd often talks about the singularity, which they refer to as the point at which machine intelligence exceeds human intelligence. But there's, there's another kind of singularity that I think we've already reached. And, um, and that is that the rate at which technology is changing is faster than the rate at which human beings can intelligently understand it and regulate it. And uh, if you just you know, look at the rate at which governments get things done, and then you compare it to the rate at which Facebook gets things done, and it's, it's not because Facebook, the people who run Facebook are necessarily smarter or better, it's because they're, they're dealing with the technology which is moving really fast. And there is something, you know, uh, we got to figure that out. I think it's also important to talk about what we can do, because if we're part of the misinformation network in a sense, then what, what can we do better? And there are a number of academic and nonprofit efforts underway. You know, there's something called the News Literacy Project. Um, the Newseum in, in Washington has a news uh, media literacy course. This, at Stony Brook University, they actually have this online course that you can take. And someone has, um, I like this, they've created something they call the CRAP test. So you can help determine if news is crap, but it's an acronym. And CRAP is currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, purpose. You know, guidelines that you can try to take a look at what you're consuming and determine whether this is correct. But I, I, I agree that we need to do something, but I'm, I'm beginning to feel that so much burden is being put on the news consumer that it may be unrealistic to think that most people are actually gonna go through these steps and determine if what they're, what they're consuming is correct. Any of you have a view on what we can do and how realistic it is that most people are, aren't joint, just going to let information wash over them and not consider whether it's credible or not? So there was a scholar, James Carey, who wrote in the 1990s about two different models of communication. The transmission model, which is this idea that a message moves from A to B, versus the ritual model, which makes us recognize that people's relationship with information is not simply about learning more facts. We have an emotional connection to information. So I, many of those projects are excellent, and I'm glad they're getting more money now, and more school children and adults will go through those projects. But what we need, and this is something that Craig Silverman talked about back in the um, last fall, is um, teaching emotional skepticism. If you find a piece of information and it makes you feel smug or angry or sad, you need to recognize that in yourself and know that when you have had your emotions triggered, you're much less, much less likely to be critical. I mean, I have created you know, news literacy programs. Does that mean that sometimes I nearly retweet a false image from Puerto Rico? Yes, because I'm, I want to, I have a connection with it and I want to share it. So we can put more facts into the ecosystem, we can train more people, but we need to respond to our emotional responses. So what I'd like to see the platforms do is mean that you cannot share something if you haven't read it to the end, and you shouldn't be able to share anything until you've had two minutes to calm down. <laughs> because ultimately our brains are lazy and, and we, need to we need to learn that. Yeah. By the way, we want to open this up to the floor. Um, we have two microphones. If anyone would like to ask a question, please come down. We'd love to hear what you think. You can put questions to any of us. And while you decide if you have questions, I'll throw another one out. Uh, you're making me think, Claire, that uh, it turns out that Carl Sagan has this book, and there's a, uh, it's called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. But it has a chapter titled The Fine Art of Baloney Detection. And, and, and Carl Sagan used to have this saying that says that most scientists have like, this internal baloney detection kit. Because they're scientists, they think about things in a very kind of methodical way. And they think, is there a weakness in this chain of argument and so forth. And again, I think it'd be wonderful if all of us did that. I'm just wondering if we're, we're asking too much of people to think that they might actually do that. Do, do any insight you have, Marnie, into sort of um, human nature given the work you do and whether people are likely to be this skeptical? Well, we do trade in emotional connections and so I wouldn't personally want people to have to wait two minutes to share our stories. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe it is about coupling that with making an appeal to people's senses. Um, the way that politicians have to show that their promises have value, material value to the voters, and that they will have the most material value to voters, maybe we need to start building in that sort of appeal within journalistic outlets that, that people can see, and, and I personally already see it, of course, but you know, 
the New York Times or the major news outlets, they have this quality assurance layer that we need to make people see the difference in between that versus uh, a meme that was shared on Facebook. We need these differentiations to be made clear. They do, but even that quality assurance layer has been called into question. You know, maybe maybe in some ways unfairly by the president, but certainly the, the Times itself has acknowledged that, you know, that it that it did it always do its job as well as it had hoped. So it's this very complicated calculus going on. And then at that point, maybe you need to show them what can be made better about. A reader needs to know that they're going to put 20 minutes into reading an article that's going to be worthwhile to them. And then we have to determine what their worth is, what that, and if the worth is purely emotional and the emotional connection made with it, then probably that emotional education and teaching skepticism is going to be even more important. Sure. Questions from the crowd? Oh, sure. <laughs> so um, I guess I would like to uh, introduce a problem, which is, that uh, both of our major political parties use all this information gathering, Facebook, Google uh, techniques, uh, to help themselves stay in power. So one wonders uh, where the, uh, the supervision would come from uh, for these, these large companies. And I think of them as, uh, or the phenomenon as being the privatization of Orwell. Uh, it's not the government that is, uh, or it, in addition to the government, you have all these very, very powerful um, forces that are gathering information for purposes that have to do with their own private interest. And then I would ask, what do you think Marshall McLuhan would say about our media environment now? The first question is basically who is to police the technology companies? Is there anyone really to police them other than, them, than themselves? The Onion. <laughs> but also Europe, she yeah, says yeah. with her European Ooh. accent. Well, that's true, right? Europe has been much, much tougher, exactly. Yeah, we are going to see regulation coming out of Europe pretty soon, I think, and it's going to change what happens, and I think the other thing is, these platforms run on our data. So I think in the next 10 years, there will be a movement where users themselves say, that's my data. So Google will know before me if I get breast cancer from the searches that I make. So there will be a movement where people say, I need that data back because it's mine. So that and information pollution, and just the, their, their size and their influence in terms of how people get information now, they can't, they're not just social networks, they are really the number one source of information for people worldwide, and for that reason, they, they need regulation. And to the second question, any additional thoughts on the media today, other than what we've already talked about during our panel? Anything anyone wanted to add? You want to elaborate a little bit on how you... The, the targeting issue is, I think, very fundamental. There, there, are, there are two characteristics that I think are very important about what these systems currently provide. One is the ability to target so precisely. And the second is the echo chamber phenomenon, which is that you speak with people you want to speak with and don't have to speak with anybody else. And when you combine those two things, you, you get a, a very unstable situation. And your, I think, very astute point about the political duopoly in the United States is uh, also very relevant. Facebook has no interest in limiting political campaign spending. This would be an understatement. They make billions of dollars from it. Question on this side? Um, yeah, I guess this is speaking of Europe. Um, you mentioned before that the, there were some uh, social networks sort or of stories going on in the German election. I'm curious, are, are other democracies having these same kind of issues and same conversations or something unique about American democracy and culture that uh, it's, it seems to be more tumultuous here? So I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but uh, in November when there was this sudden waking up to this, the rest of the world did a kind of a slow hand clap and said, welcome to the party America. Because globally, this has been an issue for a long time. And even now, if you look at places in Asia Pacific, the problem there is closed messaging apps. So things like WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, these kind of message, messaging services that are encrypted 
and rumors are flying in those spaces and we have no idea what those spaces are and the motivations in different parts of the world. I mean, the role of China and disinformation in Asia Pacific coming from China, but Azerbaijan, Bahrain, I mean, these have been problems in many, many places. And of course, Europe has struggled with Russian disinformation for a long time. If you look at Finland, which interestingly has a very strong news literacy curriculum in their schools, and they're quite proud of the fact that actually, whilst there is there are very strong disinformation campaigns in Finland, it's not having the same impact. The specific element to the US context is the polarization here is stunning. So when you have the divisions that you have in this country, it means that when you're trying to sow disinformation, you already have you know, two groups who no longer have debates and say, that's interesting, let me hear what you think. It's you say something that I don't agree with and I say I hate you. I mean, where does that take us when we don't actually have that middle ground to debate? So when we look at what happened in the 2016 election, it was laid on top of a very polarized country. And, you know, in Italy, who are about to have their elections, which is also polarized, it's very splintered, it's very different. Here, the kind of the Republican, the left, right here is really there's nowhere else in the world that's, I think, quite as stringent. Uh, and, and also um, just the numbers of people. So we've been monitoring European elections. No Macedonian teenagers made French fabricated news sites or German fabricated news sites because there wasn't the market there. Whereas in the US, you have 360 million people who can potentially see adverts on the side of a website. So this is a huge market for people who are trying to make money out of fabricated content. Claire, because other countries have been through this before we have and we're late to the party in a sense, anything we can learn from them, either to anticipate what's to come or to try to prevent and derail what might be to come? I mean, I think the first thing is, is simply looking outside your borders. Again, no offense. But um, sometimes it's very easy to believe that you're the first people who've gone through this. And I am kind of astonished that there isn't a wider conversation about what's happening elsewhere. And if we look at technology in Asia Pacific, that's what we're going to face in the US in two years' time. So there's all this obsession over here about the Facebook news feed. And we're not saying, what does this look like? But actually, everybody's on these closed messaging apps. What does it look like? And so that's my concern, is that we're not really thinking ahead of, of, of where we are, or virtual reality, or augmented reality, or just artificial intelligence. You know, the technology that's coming down the line, we're stuck right now talking about Donald Trump and Facebook, and we're not thinking about the next two to five years. Uh, Marnie or Charles, either of you want to weigh in on any of that? Sure. A <laughs> uh, question over here. Um, I think it's a, I have a commentary, and it leads into a question. Um, and to your point, I actually was watching Brexit very uh, closely because to me, it told me what was going to happen in the United States. And um, sure enough, it did. Um, but it does lead me into the question I have. And it seems to me that there's an over expectation of the media as well. And at what point do you also look at having an educated population to understand what the media is reporting on? I mean, for me, Part of how I assess news is looking at consistency across the board among trusted media that I go to. I mean, for instance, I read the New York Times, the Washington Post, and The Economist as loyalists, and I look at that consistency across the board to say, okay, where is there a gap falling? Where is there not? And that, it, to me, as a consumer, is where I actually have to do my due diligence. But the reality is, if you look at education in this country and look at education population, there's serious populations not only in this country, serious problems in this issue, but there are also across the world. So at what point does the media and kind of the societal issues around it play a role in terms of creating that balance in a democracy? Yeah, I think it's an important question. It gets at sort of the failures of our public education system and how that factors in. Any thoughts from the panel? I like to think that uh, the content we provide readers is sort of like flexing that muscle and sort of creating this critical reading skill among people who consume it. And um, I think that that's going to be important. There, there should be high expectations on us as the general public as well. It can't just be that um, journalistic outlets are putting in like these controls or these... Uh, quality assurance layers. It's that we have to rise to that occasion. And we do this as you know, consumers of any other good um, or service. We do our research, we compare, and we try to make the best decision, even while there are agencies looking out for you know, protecting those consumers. I think the same has to be true of the media on both, on both ends of the, uh, the product. 
I have a variation on that question, which is what do we do about the fact that there will be some people that just will never do that? They'll never read the Post and the Journal and the Times and, and sort of they'll just, they'll just accept what they read and hit the share button. So what do we do about the fact that there's always going to be that portion of the population? Don't reward them. <laughs> don't reward them? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that at the very least, if they're always going to be there, then they always have been there. And if anything's changed, maybe it's the level of reward that they reap for that inactivity. What is the reward they get for that? When you say reward, how do you mean? Uh, the election results, maybe. <laughs> um, but also just uh, the echo chambers and the, um, the sort of just constant reassurance by the, the outlets that they choose to read. And maybe what we do is take away the, uh, the social acceptability of that. I, I don't know how we would do that, but it's maybe a place to start from. I mean, there was the Edelman Trust Barometer, and they measure trust every single year. And recently, for the first time, people said that the thing they trust the most when you look at institutions, politicians, media, except, is somebody who's like me. So when we talk about where people get their news from, because the internet allows you to get it from anywhere, and because of confirmation bias, we are more likely to seek out outlets that are telling us information that reaffirms our worldview. So when we have these ideas about the mainstream media that people should read, I have concerns that there are many people out there who are reading lots of information, but they're reading information that confirms their worldview, which leads the polarization that we're already struggling with is gonna get even worse. So um, I don't have a solution to this, but it's the thing that keeps me awake at night. A question over here. Hi. For a while now, I've kept a close eye on iNews or Apple News. You swipe over from your home page on the phone and see the four news stories of the hour. <clears throat> I've done this for two reasons. One, what should I know? And two, what do they want me to know in an Orwellian sense? Uh, so there's a lot of power in what news stories are shown and what publications. I am curious if either of you have made observations or have any thoughts about that. About the quality of that news in particular? About that new format. I think I'm not alone in checking that routinely. And the, you know, like I have no idea who chooses that. Is it Apple? Um, and just the, the power behind that and what dangers that could it's an extremely fundamental issue, and it, it's not just Apple. It's not just uh, that particular feed. It's uh, the same core issue arises with Facebook and Google and the other firms that do this sort of thing. And uh, they're, so first of all, they have power over you by how they do that. But something that hasn't, I think, received quite as much discussion, but which is perhaps even more important, is they also have power over the media. They get the money. The New York Times doesn't get the money. And, uh, and they control how many people read the New York Times, not the New York Times. People don't go to the New York Times website by going to the New York Times website. They go to it either through Facebook or Google. And... Um, and the same is true of you know, all the major news organizations that you would think of. And that is, uh, I, I, my own view is that, is that that's a potentially quite dangerous situation. So it's a great question about algorithms because they shape everything. And going back to opacity, the fact that we don't understand how algorithms are created, there's also the trust question. People are much more trusting of algorithms because they believe that computers are more trustworthy. But they're not computers. Algorithms are written by people. And they're often written by young white men in Silicon Valley. So one of my favorite algorithm stories is, it, I think it's still true. If you go to Google Images and you search female CEO, the only picture of a woman is CEO Barbie. Now, nobody said 
women can't be CEOs and therefore we will take out pictures of women from Google Images. It's simply the way the algorithm was written. Nobody thought through. There are fewer female CEOs, so it's likely that we will have fewer female CEOs in Google search results, but what does that say? So going back to the algorithm of Apple News, I do have real concerns when we don't know how these algorithms are written. It will be based on what you click on. So the more you click on certain types of stories, it's more likely to give you those stories. So if you really care about Syria, you'll get more Syria. If you really care about cat videos, you'll get more cat videos. And that's the bigger concern. But also bear in mind that people have always decided what went on the front cover of a newspaper. That in itself was a form of algorithm. Again, normally done by white men. No offense. Um, and so when I used to teach undergraduates and I'd teach them news values, and I'd say, well, how do they decide? And this student once said, I only ever thought seven things happened a day. Like they'd never thought that there were decisions to not cover certain stories. So the algorithms in Apple News are a kind of an algorithm on top of an algorithm. Um, but it, we should have much more transparency about the algorithms, whether it's Netflix or Amazon or Apple News or Facebook or Twitter. They all use algorithms. It's meant to give us a better experience. But without the transparency, I don't know why they're deciding to give me certain information. And just a bit of commentary on this. You know, the Boston Globe, where I work now, in many ways puts out two distinct products. We put out a newspaper that we deliver in the morning to subscribers, and then we have a website, bostonglobe.com, that is constantly being updated and refreshed. It's not that we just have to file stories at the end of the day for the morning paper. When I travel, I tend to read the website, and sometimes when I come home from my travels, I'll then flip through the newspaper. And I'm always amazed to find that the story that was at the top of the homepage sometimes when I'm traveling was actually buried inside the metro section in the print newspaper. It was just that we had a new story, so we added it to the homepage. And again, it's a reminder of placement and judgment calls and how placement can influence w w how important we think that story is. So I think it's, that awareness, at least, is a, is a good thing always to have in mind. You had a question? Yes, thank you. Um, and, and just maybe a, a shorthand answer to your previous questioner is that when he said, I'm not really sure how it's chosen, um, I think your point could be reduced to you choose a lot of it yourself through your prior clicks. What you chose last time influences what you choose this time. So to my question, which is a little odd, so I'm hoping that you'll curate a little bit, maybe jigsaw it into uh, uh, the right question to ask. It, I was really pleased that you mentioned the fake news of the 1800s and, and the quotes from Jefferson. And, and I think it's interesting to look at this anthropologically and even expand the time scale back further um, even though it's much more macro and much more supercharged now and much faster, these phenomena have occurred before. Uh, maybe it's, it's tiring to hear that. It's the same old thing, just an echo of old phenomena, but it might be useful to also look at well, how societies responded before and sorted it out. So for instance, the printing press was a, was a crisis for, for certain powers. Um, the Silk Road, um, emigration for, for business and trade, they all spread information in new ways and in higher speeds than before. And of course, in, in the last century, that radio and technology and, and, and TV, et cetera. So how did each society, it's an open question really, but how did societies react and sort it out before? And I would conjecture that um, what you're doing now is actually the process. It's uh, you know figuring out how to come up with the quality assurance, or to question what do people really want when they, when they click something? Do they want to make an emotional connection? Yes, sometimes true. Do they want to know the truth? What actually happened over there? Because I want to know where to put my money or my vote. Um, so this is the process where I think technology will potentially, or, uh, or politics or uh, policy, will help us out eventually and, and figure out a way um, to verify certain information and to also create the selection of information that you actually feel you need and with, with a full disclosure of all the information you could have so that you have not just only curated answers but also answers from primary sources that you can reach yourself. So hopefully stopping short of you know, going into the pizza par parlor and finding out that, oh, okay, nothing bad was happening here. There may be good ways to verify what's, um, what's actually happening and what's important to you. And I, I think that technology could play a big role in that now. Think, for instance, of biometrics, um, ways of verifying who actually said what and when, um, or, that, or that mechanism you mentioned about you know, verifying um, the, the validity of, of, a, of, a, of a textual quote. So I leave it at that to comment upon. So for the history piece of the question, anyone have enough of sense of history to know in the past when there has been a crisis of information, how did the public handle that and process that? Do we know? Well, uh, I'm 
deeply immersed now in the Watergate scandal and the Nixon administration. Uh, Nixon had, uh, people working for Nixon had a, a quite substantial fake news operation which uh, may have actually played a quite serious role in the 1972 election. There's dispute about this. People, you know, some people think yes, some people think no. But it, it, it's not at all silly to think that it was a factor. What form did it come in back then? It came in the then technologically appropriate form. You know, so for example, there were people who were forging uh, letters to the editor which were sent to newspapers and which were sometimes published. There were people who were forging political advertisements which were actually fake. There were people who um, had, uh, there, there were phone banks and people would make uh, calls at 3 a.m. Uh, falsely identifying themselves as coming from another candidate, another party, uh, making people angry at them. Uh, there was, you know, this kind of thing. There was something called the Canuck letter which was a forged letter published in a newspaper which alleged that uh, the then leading Democratic candidate, Senator Edmund Muskie, had made derogatory references to uh, people in, in who were an important block of voters in the New Hampshire primary. Um, and it, uh, they got away with it for about two years. And then, as part of the Watergate investigations, all of this came up. And I have to say it's impressive to see the level of outrage that followed. You know, tens of millions of people watched on television as this was exposed, and it completely transfixed the country. Uh, and I personally think that, you know, we could be there again soon. I, I agree with the gentleman just asked the question. I, you know, we're gonna figure this out. I'm optimistic in that sense. But we're gonna figure it out after a big fight. And uh, uh, Marnie? Oh, I was just gonna say full disclosure is going to be key. Uh, we have full, to full, full disclosure? Full disclosure. We, and with, with the opacity of those algorithms we were talking about earlier, we have to start thinking critically and getting mad about the fact that these things are so withheld from the public and yet inform what the public sees. We have to question the motive behind keeping those algorithms opaque to the public. And on this side. Um, a lot of the discussions focused on the consumer and what we can do to help educate them, whether emotionally or otherwise. Um, my question is, to what extent do you think weak libel laws in this country um, affect the ability of these companies or news producers to come up with fake news stories um, and get away with it? To what extent do weak libel laws in this country allow the spread of information to misinformation continue? Any thoughts on that? Hello, fellow European. Hello. <laughs> um, yes, the, the issue in this country is the First Amendment. When I say issue, I'm not being offensive about the First Amendment. Sure. But it makes it quite difficult to have these kind of conversations because people just sh show the First Amendment card. And so until we have very thoughtful conversations about what does that mean in terms of dangerous speech, I mean, when you see people tying themselves in knots around hate speech, when we, we're tying ourselves in knots now about this, I mean... I don't want anything to happen which means the onion is impacted, but I wish we could have a more nuanced conversation. And I wish we could have a more nuanced conversation about regulation in this country because people believe that the market will solve all ills. And this is kind of two Europeans having a conversation here, but it is kind of amazing when you're here to ha try and have these conversations and it's just like It crazy. just seems bizarre that, um, for example, we have the right to free speech with the exception of hate speech and hate speech is outlawed and is um, prosecuted severely in this country it's as you say the the first amendment is just waved in people's face and i just think perhaps people need a little bit more faith in a judiciary especially um, when we've got such a strong executive at the moment or an executive which can talk to the people directly perhaps we need to instill um, more of a focus on the judiciary because it's kind of been out of the way in this country i've Every day I read about what Congress is doing. Every day I read about what the president's doing. I very, very rarely read about what the judges are doing, except when Mr. Trump is criticizing them. And uh, to me, I think a bit more faith in the judiciary would be um, perhaps the best solution, especially when we look at um, the private sector being the ones who are 
doing the fact checking. You know, I don't read any US government body doing the fact checking. I read um, private companies, private news organizations doing the fact checking. I wonder where the, um, the space is in public debate for a public fact checking body. What we need here is a BBC. Sorry. True. <laughs> God save the Queen. <laughs> Thank you. On this side. Yes, I'd be uh, curious to know a little bit of uh, your opinions about where the news media might participate in social media at this point. The way it used to be was you would write an article. At most, you might have a, a handful of letters to the editor coming back. Today, you have thousands of people jumping onto an article on Facebook and Twitter and putting memes or putting comments, groups from 4chan jumping onto a, a, a story and overwhelming it with their content. Uh, on the other hand, uh, New York Times recently asked its reporters to calm down a little bit on offering their opinion. So I'm wondering if you have opinions on where the news media might carve out a way to enter into the conversation following a story? Well, I am, uh, again, I do not envy journalists this because we do not have bylines. No one can personally attach any one Onion writer's story to them, themselves. Uh, we, we create everything sort of uh, collaboratively and anonymously, and so, uh, I'm, I have the luxury of not really having an answer for that question. <laughs> You're wondering how they can engage after the story has been published and the public begins to weigh in. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, you know, in Twitter, I think, is, is very perilous for journalists. Reporters claim they're going to be objective, and then you go to their Twitter account, and they're snarky, and they really discredit, I think, their public view of whether that person is truly objective. One thing the New York Times is doing is on page two of their print paper, it's called Inside the Times or something, and every day there's one reporter who writes a first-person essay with some backstory about the story they reported. It's an effort, I think, to be more transparent about how the process works, but that's just a very small effort. Any thoughts about that? I mean, I think one of my, my saddest moments, when I, not moments, but when I think about what I hoped the web would do for journalism in the last decade, was I really hoped that it would open up a two-way conversation between the news media and the audience, and it would no longer just be gatekeepers talking at the audience. And whilst we, still, we now have the technology, uh, it hasn't happened, but that's partly because moderation takes a lot of resourcing. So when we've seen the news industry kind of ripped apart because Google and Facebook have taken a lot of the money, so we've seen these newsrooms shrink, nobody's really resourcing comments in a way that they should do. When it's done well, it's incredible. But I do feel, you know, I agree with you when you see conversations about news content happening in these different spaces and the journalists themselves aren't in those spaces. We could, we could have the most incredible news ecosystem. Um, we, at the moment, just... The technology allows it, but it also allows dark forces to get involved and people to be mean and female journalists to be abused horrifically. You know, so whilst I really wish that we could have a lovely space where we had really thoughtful conversations about the news, it ends up being moderating all the crazies. Um, and that's what, that's what makes editors say, well, we're not going to resource it, and that's sad. You have touched on a really difficult uh, ongoing problem for the media. I mean, particularly online comments just become a cesspool so quickly. It's the lowest common denominator of conversation. And so some outlets have decided I'm just going to shut them off. And I know it, at the Globe, you know, there's some people, some reporters who say, I just never read the comments. They're just so terrible. But I feel obligated to because sometimes someone might point out a mistake or they might give you a great tip or they might add something that creates a next story. So that's a really important and ongoing issue that I think hasn't yet been solved. Question on this side. I, I was an, going back to the history question uh, that other models in the 19th century about sort of how people handled this before. I just wanted to introduce the idea that the economic basis of journalism r completely shifted before the penny press, subscription newspapers. The penny press was the introduction of a commercial model where news was entertainment. And other, though that then took over in most of the 19th century, there persisted, for example, the broad uh, community journalism associated with the People's Party, lots of newspapers then, lots of socialist newspapers. So those varieties of press haven't really been engaged here, nor has the profit-making or nonprofit uh, basis of press entered into this discussion. So I just wanted to 
answer the history question, pushing it a little bit in those directions. Well, one thing I'll add to that is, I mean, part of the problem, I think, for newspapers now is there's no profit at all. And that's added a whole other level of struggle. I mean, all the ways that papers used to make money, primarily subscriptions and advertising, it's just gone. It was just decimated by the internet. So it's basically a collapsed revenue model that no one's figured out a replacement for. And that means that at a time when the press needs most, the most resources and the most ability to fact check, they're just trying to decide what can we still cover given the limited resources we have. So that's another enormous struggle now at a time when the press, I believe, it's, it's an example now of why you so much need the media to be your watchdog and your accountability organization. And it comes at a time where they're incredibly financially challenged. It's really difficult. This side. I'd be interested in your reaction specifically to public opinion polling and its future. Uh, in the Trump election, most of the acknowledged pollsters got it really wrong. Uh, are they thinking uh, just about retooling in a small way? For instance, next time we'll go to North Dakota and talk to people and, and not ignore flyover country? Uh, or are they doing such major retooling in their techniques that it might lead, for example, just to be futuristic, to something like polling online networks, finding patterns in internet activity, or whatever else might be futuristic? If I might. Uh very astute question, and uh, traditional polling, of course, relies on things like calling people up using telephones, which now is increasingly difficult because people don't have landlines, they have mobile phones, telephone numbers are in general confidential. Um, so how would you get good polling data? Well, same answer, who knows? Who knows? The answer is Facebook knows. Google knows. But are they telling us? That's you know the, these two companies really are extraordinarily important in the world now, and yes, there are others coming, and there are are, are others present as well. But um, those two companies, between them, have far more information than any political party or government. Uh. Sorry, very quickly, i just say my, my hope is that now we've worked out that polling doesn't work, is that it will prevent the news media doing the horse race coverage that doesn't get us anywhere. So this idea that we don't actually go and talk to voters and we just simply say who's winning has, meant, has led to really terrible coverage. So my hope is that because we've sort of acknowledged now that polls don't really work. So are, are you saying strategic silence factors into this? Do the media spend less time reporting on polls? I mean, I just think, you know, people have written, I mean, Kathleen Hall Jameson has talked about how dreadful horse race coverage has been for 20 years. And every four years, we see the same terrible coverage. My belief now is that readers just like, how can you keep telling us about the horse race when, you know, we know that the polls don't work? But just to Brexit, even if journalists had looked at the hashtag, the hashtag for leave Europe was double the number of stay. So even that very basic analysis could have given us more information. So I agree, Charles, that the platforms have got a much clearer sense. But then we have to wonder if those are manufactured hashtags, the volume at least. Yeah, no, in the same way as polls have real problems, sentiment on uh, these platforms also has incredible problems. Oh, hi. Um, I would like for you beautiful people here to be able to mention it to me, how I can uh, find out what real is real news and what real is fake news. And my second, my second suggestion and my second thing, as you can see, most of the people here are almost near close by my age. And all what I can see in the news and listen in the radio and everything that I do with my personal life is bad news. Why you guys are not able to do things more positive, give us us more fake or good news, whatever is true news or whatever it is, but give us us something positive, something to look forward to live, something to look forward to help our neighbors, our community. Most of the time, believe it or not, my name is Caroline. I just go and stand up and I tell everyone, oh, hi, my name is Caroline, please pray for me. They look at me like, what the hell is going on with the woman? <laughs> and I am a good educated person. I go into many scenes. I have family all over the world. Uh, I speak three languages. I've been working a lot of time on my life. 
in America, but I still cannot find out the way to get for us seniors a little more positive way to see the things. How I make a decision, how lousy our president is, and everyone is, oh, oh my gosh, yeah. But then again, it's gonna be a lot of changes. So how you guys do something to make this fake news and the real news positive? Thank you. Well, let me, I'll dress. <laughs> I'll let me address part of the second part, which is the positive news piece. I believe that if you actually read a whole newspaper, which most people don't really do anymore, there's a very wonderful balance. I mean, to me, I read online and I get papers at my house, and to me, that paper on my step every morning is like a little present, right? It's like this wonderful gift of all sorts of interesting information, and there's a lot in there that I think is a good balance. One of the things that happens when people read online is we used to talk about how you lose kind of the serendipity of reading. You turn from page four to five, and oh, look at that interesting article that's there that you might not have bothered reading or clicking on if you read on the web. So I do think there's a downside to reading online is that we're more selective and we don't get that kind of whole uh, coverage outcome. But I also think that because newspapers in particular are so financially challenged today, and their staffs are so stressed, that as we're trying to make news decisions, sometimes it's the happier feature stories that might go by the wayside because we're forced to cover the breaking news. So that's part of resource issue, which is why I always say to any captive audience I have that if you, if you have a quality media outlet you believe in, support it in some way, whether that's a donation to the public radio station you believe in or a subscription to what you read, because it's that, those donations and those subscriptions that allow us to do what we do. Your first question about how do we determine if news is fake or real, I mean, it's, it's the topic of our, our panel, but it's also the most fundamental question. I mean, is there any way to sort of summarize that briefly, even though in some ways it's been what we've tried to cover throughout? Is there any easy answer to that? Watch my films, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I'll say something about something else, though. I, I, I don't think that, that uh, the internet is a bad place for positive news. You know, go to cuteoverload.com. <laughs> Uh, and and look up cat videos on YouTube. You know, I I, I I think that actually the internet has done a lot of good for us in that regard. I, I've seen lots of extremely cute things. There are, but I do think that there is a distinction between the cute stuff and covering the very positive things that are happening in people's communities. So I definitely take that point, that sometimes those are the things that are harder to get the media to think are worth their time to cover. Can I just jump in and say that there's a great movement called Solutions Journalism. There's a Solutions Journalism Network, and they're trying to do exactly that, which is rather than just talking about the California fires and how terrible it is and how many people lost their lives, actually talking about how people can support that, how the community themselves can help one another. And there has been some really great research with African-American communities in South LA who just said, we don't read the newspaper anymore because when we do and we see stories about our own communities, they're just negative. And so they actually put in some experimental newspapers that were made up, but for research, that were full of positive solutions journalism stories. And the community said, well, where are these stories normally? These are amazing. And so I think journalists sometimes are worried about doing positive stories because they see it as activism or it's not our role to get into the communities. I think now, because we're suffering this moment of lack of trust, I think those kind of stories and helping communities connect with one another, particularly at the local level, I mean, the decimation of local newspapers in the US has to be seen as a factor when we also look at what's happened over the last year. So I think, you know, your idea if more editors heard you say that, also thanks for saying we're beautiful, you're also lovely, um, then I think there would be more editors who'd say there is a financial reason for us to do this. And I think that at the moment, anything that looks like there might be some more money to be made would be a positive thing. You know, I know someone who lives up in the area in California that had the fires, and he, I, there was a group email sent out to say, we're fine. But they mentioned that someone had a horse farm up there with more than 100 horses. And the person put out a call that said, I need trailers so I can move these horses away from the fire. And apparently 40 people showed up with pickup trucks and horse trailers. That's kind of a wonderful story, you know, and I, I, I hope that things like that are being covered as well because I think people need that balance. I uh, have a historical perspective here to bring to you. I'm a scholar of Adam Smith, obviously the father of capitalism, but we have a disinformation, misinformation issue with Adam Smith that gets in the way of your hope for perhaps within 10 years having some regulation of this. How do you regulate a capitalist system when we think the father of capitalism believed in laissez-faire? He did not. 
He believed in a system of justice, liberty, and equality as the recipe for a wealthy nation. More and more economists know this, but our politics, our economics, is not based on this ethical model. How do we deal with that? An educated population would be a good start. That seems like a nice way to close. Thank you very much for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Thanks and questions. I'm going to have the last word. The, uh, some of you may have seen this. I, I found this on the internet. It's an infographic, how to spot fake news. Um, and it's a little oversimplified, but it's a good guide, I think. Uh, there are eight entries. Uh, consider the source is number one. Click away from the story to investigate the site, its mission, and contact information. Check the author. Do a quick search on the author. Are they credible? Are they real? <laughs> Check the date. Reposting old news stories doesn't mean they're relevant to current events. Check your own biases. Consider if your own beliefs could affect your judgment. Read beyond. Headlines can be outrageous in an effort to get clicks. What's the whole story? Uh, supporting sources, click on those links, determine if the info given actually supports the story. Is it a joke? <laughs> Enough said. And finally, ask the experts. Ask a librarian or consult a fact-checking site, which, of course, there are issues there as well, but there is some guidance there. I want to thank our wonderful panel for a fascinating conversation. Thank you.